Greetings. Um, this is a response to Lance Connolly, my friend Lance Connolly's video, his response to me, uh, response to Joel Sexton's video. That, that was the title of Lance's video. I jotted down some notes as I went through uh, of what Lance was saying, and here is going to be a quick response as I only have 27 minutes here of data on the tablet. So... Let's get right to it. I'm going to start with Romans 11. The fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles. And its definition is right, I agree. Uh, to be filled to capacity, fullness, means the ship is full to capacity. That's pretty much what it means. Full to capacity. No, no more can come in. That's Romans 11. The fullness of the Gentiles. Okay. I'm going to spend some time here on Romans 9 through 11. Then we'll touch on some of the other things Lance brought up. Uh, first off, in Romans 10, 18, in Romans 16, 25, and 26, the gospel's been preached to all the world. Romans 10, 18, the gospel's been preached to all nations, is Matthew 24, 14. Preach the gospel to all nations, then the end will come, the end, end of the age. Romans 16, 25, and 26 is Mark's version of the Olivet Discourse, Mark 13, 10, and Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Um, the reason Paul spoke of the fullness of the Gentiles in Romans 11 is because he preached the gospel to all nations. He preached the gospel to all nations, he says it twice, and he echoes the sayings of Jesus almost verbatim. Romans 10, 18 is Matthew 24, 14. No doubt about it. Romans 16, 25 is Mark 13, 10 and Matthew 28. So Paul preached the gospel to all nations, that's why he could speak of the fullness of the Gentiles coming in, because the gospel went to all nations. Um, uh, Romans 10.18, which is a direct citation of Christ's command to preach to all the world, then the end of the age would transpire. Same as Romans 16.25 and 26, which again is direct from Mark 13 and Matthew 28.18. In Romans 10, we have a litany of prophetic promise passages that Paul says were being fulfilled under his ministry. We have Deuteronomy 30, verse 12 and verse 14. We have Joel 2, 32, Isaiah 52, 7, Isaiah 65, 1, and we have also a, not a promise, but a curse, Deuteronomy 32, is brought in. But we see he also refers to the faithful remnant Isaiah of Isaiah chapter 10.22, Isaiah 1.9. Um, in, in Romans chapter 9 and in Romans 11, 5 and 7, Paul says, at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Um, also, it is also a critical text is used for the rebellious nation, yes, which rejected the perfect righteousness of Christ for their filthy rags. That's Deuteronomy 32, 21. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 27 through 32 is Israel's last days. All agree with that, even dispensationalists. Thomas Ikes, Ice and Mark, Mark Hitchcock in a and a work I have, state that. Others state that as well. Dwight Pentecost, they state that. Deuteronomy 32 is Israel's latter end, her last days. And we see this used in Acts chapter 2, verse 40. Peter says, repent of this perverse generation. And he solemnly warned them and testified about that. I wonder what he had to say. What, what's he speaking about? Repent of the, this in front of him, this perverse generation. 
He's speaking about the, the unbelieving crowds. They, they, and just before that, he says, repent to be baptized. And you'll receive forgiveness. So, Peter uses Deuteronomy 32, repent of this perverse generation, like Jesus, adulterous generation, same thing. In Romans 10, we see Paul using it, of Israel of his day, unbelief in Israel that is fallen. In Hebrews chapter 10, in speaking of unbelief in Israel, persecuting the saints in Palestine, Deuteronomy 32 is used there as well. So we see Deuteronomy chapter 32 is used in speaking of Israel of the first century. And it's prophetic. It's Israel's last days, as even the Dispies would agree. So we have that, but we also have the, the promises, and we're, we're going to get to that. I want to get to the timing, the timing, the timing parameter here in, in, in Romans. Romans 10, 27 and 28, he speaks of the remnant that's coming in. Quote in Isaiah chapter 10, and he says, The Lord will make a short work in the earth. In what? Gathering the remnant. That's Romans 10, 27 and 28. In Romans 11, 5 and 7, In the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gr gracious choice. Verse 7, what then? What Israel is seeking, national Israel, it has not obtained. That's salvation, the covenantal promises. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. We see in Romans chapter 3, just because, just because most of Israel did not believe, does does that mean the the does that mean the faithfulness of God is nullified? God forbid. Let every man be called a liar, and let God God be true. In Romans chapter thirteen, eleven through thirteen, we see the language of day and night. We see in Ephesians the language of day and night to speak of. This age in the, the coming age, the coming kingdom. Um, in Romans 13, it's the same thing. Uh, Romans 13, 11 through 13. Now, the question is, is, is the salvation of Romans 13 different than Romans 11? 25 through 27? I, I don't think so. Do this, knowing that the time, there's two words for time in the Greek, uh, Kronos, Kronos, and Keros. Keros, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, is the appointed time. Or it's a synonym also for age. Synonym also for age. The present time. So it's the appointed time. It's not just time, it's the appointed time. Or the age, especially in this context. In certain contexts, like Romans 13, it's the age. Um, how do I know that? Wasn't from Don Preston, uh, Lance. We'll we'll get to that. Do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awake from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone. That's the the old age, and the day is near. Therefore, let, let us lay lay aside all deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. That's Ephesians 5, Ephesians 6, Ephesians 4. Let us behave properly, as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual uh, promis prom promiscuity and sensuality and strife, so on and so forth. And so is this salvation different, this salvation different than Romans 11? It's near. It's so near, it's the appointed time. It's the end of the age. That is not different than Romans chapter 11. Then we see, of course, the remnant idea of Romans 10, 27, and 28. He will make a short work in the world, 
get gathering the remnant. And of course, the remnant was there in Romans 11, 5, and 7. Uh, Romans 10, 18, and 16, 25, and 26. The Gospels preached to all nations. That helps with timing. So we have the remnant would be gathered in in a short time. We see Romans 13, the appointed time, salvation is nearer than we first believed. Then we see Romans 10, 18, Paul preached the gospel to all nations. Romans 16, he preached the gospel to all nations. Point number four, when it comes to the time and parameter, contextually in Romans, Israel's restoration judgment was present then. Because what does Paul do? What does Paul do? He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 12 and 14. Deuteronomy 27 and 28 and 29. Covenant cursings. Deuteronomy 30, that, that chapter alone, is the restoration of Israel. So, to the land. Deuteronomy 30, 12 through 14. Land. Joel chapter 2, verse 32. The Davidic kingdom and the land promise, he quotes. Isaiah 52, verse 7, that's Zion being restored. And then Isaiah 65, verse 1, that's the new heavens and new earth. That's all in Romans chapter 10. Then in Romans 9, we see national Israel are vessels of wrath. Vessels of wrath. And we see wrath in Romans speaking of the day of judgment. Now, the fullness came in. The gospel was preached to all the world. The fullness came in. Salvation was near. The appointed time was near. Well, what did we do? Well, Romans 10, 18, gospels were preached to all nations. Romans 16, preached to all nations. Romans 15, 28, what does Paul say? After saying the gospels were preached to all nations, he wants to go to Spain and preach the gospel. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 5, 6, and 23, the gospel went to all the world. It's bearing fruit. It's been preached to every creature under heaven, Mark 16, 16. But yet in Colossians 4, 2, and 3, he says, Let there a door be opened that the gospel may be preached to others also. So even though the co covenantally, the gospel's been preached to all the world. It was still to go out after the parousia and, and soon coming judgment. That's the timing parameter. Now, here's some, some sporadic notes. Uh, he says, oh, 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 he says, because I, I went to dawn when I was in my, in my, um, in my video saying, you know, from... Uh, abandoned and strong partial preterism again for full preterism I had this book here by Don Preston because there's a chart in here that shows Matthew 24 through 25 is lined up perfectly with first and first and second Thessalonians so he thinks I'm getting all my theology from Don well no 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 uh, James G. G. D. Dunn uh, says the same thing and goes even farther in his work, um, The Theology of Paul. Uh, he says the same thing, uh, Jesus, Paul, and the Gospel. The, 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 well, let's just take a gander here. What, what, what I have, this... The library's over there and over here. This is just what I have here. Whit Whitman on the parables of Jesus. E.P. Sanders, top New Testament scholar. The historical figure of Jesus. Bruce, Bruce Metzger, the New Testament, its background, so on and so forth. The Expository Bible Commentary, Volume 10. Notes on the parables by Trench. Harmony of the Gospels. Uh, the, the, Jesus and the Victory of God by uh, N.T. Wright. Who's this Babylon and we shall meet him in the air by uh, Preston. Jesus versus Jerusalem. Uh, the Parousia. 
a commentary on Mark, another commentary from the Interpreter's Bible commentary on Luke, Matthew Henry's Concise Commentary, uh, the Lutheran Study Bible, uh, King James Giant Print, uh, Dumbo Nose Commentary, and a New American Standard. So, you know, um, it's not all about Don Preston. Uh, I, 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 I take the meat and spit out the bones. I can develop arguments on my own. Um, a, 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 as, as Lance said, Joel developed the, the argument for judgment and justification. Did I get that from Don Preston? No, I didn't. Um, but Matthew 16, 27, and 28 is not the second coming. Well, what's Matthew... What's, what happens is Matthew 16 is divided, usually. 27 and 28 are divided. They're not divided, though. They're united. It, that can be demonstrated in numerous ways. Um, uh, but the point is, verse 27, how, how is verse 27, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels to reward every man according to his deeds, how is that the ascension? How's that the ascension? Because that's what Lance said. Um, he says it's not about the second coming. Uh, well, just, just just briefly, a couple a, a couple points. Number one, we have salvation and we have judgment. They go together. They go together. Um, we have the judgment, Matthew 16, 27, verse 28. We have the kingdom, salvation, judgment, kingdom. They go together. You see that in the prophets. The scholars recognize that. Don, who I just quoted, N.T. Wright in, in Jesus and the Victory of God, has a whole section on that. Um, that's just scripture. Um, also, the word for, for truly, amen. That word... When it's introducing a inter, in, when it's beginning a sentence, is confirming and expounding upon what has been said before. So there's no divorce from twenty seven and twenty eight in Matthew chapter sixteen. There's no divorce whatsoever. And I'm working on an article on this, uh, and I'm running out of time. On Matthew 16, 27, and 28, in trying to answer the objections, Pentecost, Transfiguration. Uh, but uh, let me see here. For the Son of Man is, is going to, no, now watch this. For the Son of Man is about to come. Mellow is abused. You're right, Lance. And I agreed with you guys the other day in, in the thread, you, me, and Sam, when Sam and I had it out. It is abused, but D.A. Carson, in his commentary, R.T. France, say, uh, they translated a boat, mellow a boat. That's how they translate that. So mellow does mean a boat in esch eschatological passages. For the Son of Man is a boat to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will repay every man according to his deeds. Truly, truly, that's amen. Truly or verily. He's confirming what he just said. You can't split 27 and 28 up because he's confirming what he just said. I challenge anyone, look, go through Matthew. I just went through Matthew for fun. Go through the whole New Testament. In the King James Version, 101 times we see this word. Every time it is to confirm. Every time to confirm what was just said. It's not introducing a new subject. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Um, so we have two time statements. For the Son of Man is about to come, and then we see that some standing here will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Watch. Verse 21. Jesus says he's going to be killed in Jerusalem. Verse 24 through 26. He says, pick up your cross as a sign of martyrdom. They were going to be killed, persecuted. Then he says he's going to come in judgment in his kingdom. What do we, what do we have contextually in the Matthew portion of Scripture? 
Matthew 21, 22, 23 say the exact same thing. Matthew 21, the parable of the wicked husbandman. Verse 33 through 44, what do we see? We see the prophets were killed. They were sent to Israel. They were killed. The son is killed. And then the disciples are killed. What happens? Jesus comes in his kingdom, takes the kingdom away from Israel and gives it to a nation. Exodus 19, Israel is called the nation. That's the remnant. Takes it from the nation and gives it to the nation bearing the fruits thereof. We have the prophets, Jesus, the disciples, then judgment in his coming. Matthew 22, we see the same thing. The prophets are, are killed. Jesus is killed. And then the disciples are killed. And he comes in the marriage and the city is burnt. Matthew 23, there's no doubt about it. If, if you want to disagree with Matthew 21 and 22, go to Matthew 23. Everyone agrees there. Everyone agrees. You built the sepulchres of, of the prophets, which is like you're admitting that you killed the prophets. You killed the prophets. I'm going to send you wise men and scribes. You're going to persecute them from city to city, from synagogue to synagogue, or as Luke says in Luke 11, 49 and following, apostles and prophets. And what's he say? Your house is left to you desolate. All these things will be required of this generation. The vindication of Jesus' suffering, the prophet's suffering, and the apostles and prophets' suffering would be in that generation. That's Matthew 22, Matthew 21, Matthew 16. That's just, that's just one point on Matthew 16. I, 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 I can go on. Uh, and I'm, I got five minutes here. Um, uh, let, let me see here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. Oh, well, Ro Romans 2, 6. My point in Romans 2, 6 is that that's, that's um, a direct citation of Matthew chapter 16, 27. He will repay everyone according to their deeds. Every commentary on Matthew will say that. Well, if Matthew is 80, 70, Matthew 16, 27, which it is, and yet Romans 2, 6, it's a direct citation that wrath is going to come upon the Jews in the universal judgment, Matches up perfectly. Romans 2 6 is taken from Matthew 16 27. And yet, this is the judgment. And yet, Romans 2 6 is speaking of wrath coming upon the Jews. 1 Timothy 4 14, a direct citation again of Matthew 16 27. They'll be judged according to their deeds. Also, 2 Timothy 4 1. At the appearing of Christ, he will judge the living and the dead in his kingdom. That's Matthew 16 27 and 28. Jesus is going to come in the glory of the Father in judgment in his kingdom. Salvation and wrath. Hmm, I only got three minutes left here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. Let's do it. See if I can get it in here. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. And I'm dealing, Lance, with textual 
exegetical textual stuff, not theology implications, theology. I'm dealing with exegetical textual stuff at the moment. But Thessalonians, and this should do it because uh, we've got like two minutes. Oh, I wish I had my laptop. I got this and no data on it at all. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that, that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the ut utmost, or or to the complete end. It's the strongest word you can use for the filling up of wrath. Orge. Here, 1 Thessalonians 2, 16. Wrath has come upon the Jews to the utmost for those reasons. Killing Jesus, uh, killing the prophets, the, killing the apostles, and not letting the gospel be preached out. We see the word wrath there. Orge. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom we raise from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Is this a different wrath? A chapter later? No, it's not. This is the parousia, 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. Uh, you have, they killed Jesus, they killed the prophets, and they drove us out. What's that? That's Matthew 23. Killed the prophets, killed Jesus, killing the apostles and prophets, all of this coming upon this generation. That's Matthew 24 as well, Matthew 21, 